So welcome and good evening. I'm uh, Jed Levine. I'm the president and CEO of Caring Kind, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to what is our 32nd annual meeting on research. And let me tell you that if I thought 32 years ago, uh, I actually wasn't here 32 years ago, I was here 30 years ago, that we would have a dentist and a, an app developer. I don't think 30 years ago we knew what apps were, actually. Uh, on a panel about research, uh, looking at new diagnostics and uh, developments in uh, early detection of Alzheimer's disease and uh, progressive cognitive decline, uh, we could not have predicted this. So uh, I'm delighted that you're all here tonight. Uh, we are taping tonight. So uh, it will be, uh, be on our website for those if you have friends or family that couldn't attend. Uh, just go to the Caring Kind website in a couple of uh, days or weeks. We'll let you know, and uh, you're welcome to uh, share that with them. Um, I want to acknowledge some of our board members who are here tonight. Jeff Jones, and I saw Ben Jenkins, and I believe that Sonny Kanowski is here. There's oh, Sunny uh, over there. Sunny, oh there you are, Sunny. Hi. So uh, you know we're oh, very grateful to our, our uh, board of directors for their ongoing commitment to caring kind and our mission of providing information, education, and guidance for individuals with the disease and especially for their family members who are providing care and support for those family members. You know I've been in this field for a very long time. I've been here almost 30 years and for probably 10 or 12 years before that. And so I've seen a lot of information about research and a lot of things that look like, you know, the next breakthrough is going to happen. Um, and there's a lot of excitement. And I've seen also a lot of disappointment in that period of time. Um, I am optimistic by nature, uh, but I'm also realistic. And uh, I think uh, that we will eventually come to a place where we can perhaps uh, either slow down the progression of the disease, maybe, or delay the onset of the disease, perhaps. And what we'll be talking about tonight, I think, is, is kind of crucial to uh, having the information so that we can detect this disease early, because some of the difficulty with the current treatments that exist is that it's probably a little, uh, not enough, uh, a little too late. And uh, so if we can detect uh, some of these changes earlier, and as you probably know, the pathological changes in the brain happen probably 15 or 20 years prior to the onset of symptoms, that uh, having these kinds of tools to identify people who are at risk for developing the disease is going to be very interesting. And let me give you a little bit of a scoop without giving too much information away. But later this week, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, there will be a, an article about a new study that's uh, going to be published uh, later this week uh, about just that, identifying modifiable risk factors. So look for that later this week in the Wall Street Journal. And today in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article about the loneliness and the isolation of both people with the disease and their family caregivers. And that certainly relates very much to what we do here at um, uh, at Caring Kind. So, in the absence of a significant, meaningful treatment for Alzheimer's disease and related disorders, the best treatment is good care. And that's what we really specialize in here at Caring Kind. How many here are new to Caring Kind, have not been to a meeting, or know a couple of you? So I encourage you to meet with uh, Emily or other staff who will be at our staff table, learn about our 24-hour helpline, our over 85 support groups, all of our education and training programs, our Medic Alert Wanderers Safety Program, our outreach programs to the Latino, African American, and uh, uh, Chinese community, and very recently our, our new outreach to the Orthodox Jewish uh, community, specifically in Brooklyn. Uh, that we're very proud to be able to bring our services and programs to that community in a more uh, kind of strategic way than we had done before. Um, and also our Connect to Culture program. Uh, how many of you have been to a Connect to Culture program at some of the museums and uh, art uh, and historical societies? They're, they're wonderful. 
Let me put a plug in for something we're doing on November 8th here uh, in this room for uh, caregivers. It'll be a concert for Alzheimer's caregivers so that you get a break. The or members of the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra will be here and will be performing. And so you just simply need to call our helpline, 646-744-2900, to sign up for that. That's November 8th. Um, and let me also announce publicly for the first time that we will be reinstating an early stage program. We're adopting an early stage program that existed. It was looking for a home. It's called Beginnings. It's going to begin actually on November 5th. I believe actually they were already filled to capacity, but uh, hopefully they will, we'll be able to expand that in the next couple of uh, months or so. So um, let me turn to tonight's program. Note that following the presentations, our panel uh, will respond to as many questions as we have time for, and Max will tell you we're going to ask you to write your questions down. Staff will be collecting them, and then I'll be vetting them. Um, let me also to remind you to please either turn off your cell phones. They actually do turn off, you know. and uh, Or you can turn them on vibrate. Uh, and so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's moderator, a good friend, backed by popular demand. Uh, he's really wonderful at uh, doing this job. Dr. Max Gomez, who is a WCBS-TV medical reporter, a nine-time Emmy Award-winning journalist. And we were thrilled to honor Max in 2011 with our Public Awareness Award to recognize him for courageously sharing his story about his dad, uh, who was a physician who faced his own struggle with Alzheimer's and was the victim of uh, financial abuse and uh, told that publicly on, on uh, uh, TV. Uh, and also in our podcast series, we have a wonderful podcast series called Caregiver Storyteller, and Max was one of our first interviews for that. So you're welcome to take a look at that as well. Uh, Max is the co-author of uh, several books, uh, and one of which has a chapter on Alzheimer's. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Max Gomez. Thank you, Jed, um, and welcome all. Um, this is a much more intimate room and gathering than, than uh, we're used to for our scientific session, uh, but hopefully you can all hear okay and see okay back there. How about you guys in the cheap seats over there? You all right? okay. <laughs> see, and there's also, show up early a little bit. We're also streaming, so we also oh, have guests in the other so one. we have even yeah. cheaper seats. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they're off in the bleachers somewhere. All right, very, very good. Um, and Jed, you really shouldn't tell me, you know, ahead of time what the Wall Street Journal is going to publish a couple of days from now, because I can put that on the air tomorrow. <laughs> I've scooped that, I've scooped that, you know, Wall Street Journal. Anyway, this is going to be an interesting evening. First, we're going to get uh, kind of a research update uh, from a good friend of mine, from Peter Davies, and then we're going to hear about dentistry and an app and its applications to uh, Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's research, and, and we'll have plenty of questions there. Um, I think you've all gotten little index cards or something to, to write questions on. Yeah. I always ask people, and I think uh, Jed would say the same thing. Uh, most of you are frustrated physicians, meaning your handwriting is really awful. Uh, <laughs> so please try to print and make it clear so that I can, uh, all of us can, can read it, and we'll pass these questions uh, along to everybody else. So let me just introduce our panelists first. To my immediate left is Dr. Peter Davies. Uh, Peter became the scientific director of the Litwin Zucker Center for Research on Alzheimer's Disease at Northwell Health's Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research. All, all of that fit on a card yeah. for medical <laughs> research uh, way back in 2006. And he's a longtime friend of, of, of mine and the uh, Alzheimer's Association, and now Karen, and now Karen Kine. Uh, to his left is Angela Kamer. Angela is the associate professor in the uh, Department of Periodontology and Implant Dentistry at the NYU College of Dentistry. And last but not least on the far end there is Terry Focus, or Focas, you said, is, if, you're, if you're Greek. <laughs> I'm practicing. I've got a couple of good, good Greek friends. Uh, I'm going to have to tell them about that. Terry is a uh, Product Development Vice President for BioBi, 
covering the U.S. market on behalf of BioI. In addition to product development efforts on behalf of BioI, we're going to find out what BioI is. Terry is also the president of Overwatch Digital Health Incorporated. So let's start out with, with Peter, who's going to give us kind of an overview uh, of research and especially what happened with this biogen uh, kind of, uh, brouhaha that just broke over the, <laughs> over the last week. So Peter, take it away, please. Thank you, Dr. Um, good evening. You know, every time I come to do a program like this, I, I go on to a website called clinicaltrials.gov, which uh, lists every clinical trial that's registered with the U.S. government. Um, and if you go on that website, you can type in your disease of interest into a box and see all the clinical trials that are currently ongoing. So I just did this with Alzheimer's disease. And there are currently, if I remember correctly, 2,122 clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. That's currently registered with the government. So there's an amazing amount going on. You know, I, <coughs> I'm a full-time researcher. I do nothing but research in Alzheimer's disease, and I have a hard time keeping up with, with what's going on. There's a tremendous amount. Um, I think there is optimism in the field of, that we are inching closer to having something effective to treat this disease. And uh, my own goal uh, and our, I think, realistic aim is to slow or halt the progression of this disease. So I think we're getting close to being able to slow or halt the disease. And obviously, if, if, if that's true, then we need to diagnose early. So early diagnosis becomes critical because the joke at our institute is, you know, if we start treating people early enough, they'll all be just like Peter, you know, forgetful, loses its keys, forgets why he walked into a room, can't remember anybody's name. That's me. You know, that, that's the way I am. But in all seriousness, if we could hold patients at that kind of stage, it wouldn't be so bad. And I think that's what we're getting close to. I don't know how far that will go, and you know, how how much we can slow, but maybe we wouldn't, you know, if we could buy four or five yards, I would be very happy with that right now. Because right now we can't do anything. You know, we really don't have a drug that makes a significant difference. Um, we do have um, some approved drugs, Aricep, Namenda, um, which my own personal re experience says every patient should try. Most patients, four out of five, you won't see anything much. You just won't see a, a benefit. And then, in that case, I would say, just stop. You know, there's no point going on if you see no benefit. One patient in five, you do see some improvement. This is an approved drug. The FDA does not approve drugs without ev evidence of efficacy. That means it works a little bit. And in our experience, that's one patient in five who are brighter, remember a little better, you know, manage their lives a little better, and that lasts for about a year or maybe 18 months, and then you lose the effect. That's the best we have right now. So we recommend everybody try Aricep and Amanda. Now there's a combination of the two, Try it. You know, the side effects are minimal. Millions and millions of people have taken these drugs, so they're 
not dangerous drugs to try. <clears throat> and there may be some benefit. I do want to say a little bit about Biogen and the announcements you've seen in the press this week about a breakthrough in Alzheimer's and a treatment that will slow the disease and I hope they're right. You know, I really hope they're right. But there's a <coughs> I'm sorry. There's a couple of issues that I'm worried about. Um, one is that we've tried the same kind of drug that Biogen has five or six times in very large scale clinical studies and they've all failed. So unless Biogen has something magic in their particular version, it's probably a failure. The other issue is even harder to understand. Biogen recruited 3,000 people into the test of their drug, somewhat over 3,000. After 1,750 people completed the treatment, and again, the problem is the patient doesn't know it. The amyloid goes down, but the patients know better. The patient continues to progress as though you've done nothing. I mean, it's really, that's what I mean about it. It was an important experiment to do. It was an obvious, relatively simple thing to do. It didn't work. At least, it worked in the sense that we got rid of the amyloid. It didn't work in the sense of affecting the clinical disease in the patient. So one of the things that we learned uh, in journalism is that when you see a press release that is a screaming breakthrough, read the data, read the study, look a little bit deeper, and that's what you've got to do, whether you're a journalist like me or whether you are uh, a citizen very interested in doing something about Alzheimer's, just be careful. Uh, a, a huge dollop of skepticism uh, is, is called for pretty much at, at, at all times. All right, so let's move on uh, from Peter and, and let's hear from uh, Angela Kamer. Dr. Kamer uh, is going to talk a little bit about periodontal disease and Alzheimer's, and those are two things you don't often hear talked about in the same sentence. So, uh, Angela, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. I think that uh, Dr. Davis already uh, gave us the introduction that whether we don't have a medication that suddenly would make everything better, maybe preventing is the way to go. So th during the past uh, 10 years, I have been working with Dr. Moni De Leon, maybe some of you know, know him. Uh, he's a renowned uh, Alzheimer researcher. And we've been looking at the role of periodontal disease, of he reminded to say that it's the gum disease um, in, uh, in Alzheimer's oh, well, disease. Uh, and just oh, why periodontal disease? Yes, I am a clini clinician, I am a practicing periodontist, and I am a researcher, so that would make sense. But that's actually not the, o the only reason. If you look, if you look at the, the first slide, this one, this picture is a normal gum disease, like the gum should look. You know, it's pink, if you look at the contour, it's sharp, which denotes that there is no inflammation. And if you look at this cut through the tooth, you see that the gum here, comes right where the crown meets the root. So there is no tissue loss. If you look down, I have two pictures, one here and one lower. But if you look here, the, the gum is red, is swollen, there is a lot of uh, plaque and calculus here, and there is a lot of destruction. If you look here, the gum doesn't connect at the, uh, at the connection between the crown and the root, it went down the root. 
and the other one which is down it's a person that is 32 years old that she came to me and if you look at the radiography there is enormous amount of bone loss because periodontal disease yes it's an inflammatory disease it's an inflammation but results in the loss of tissue around the teeth that eventually can lead to uh, to, uh, to tooth loss. What I showed here, I wanted to show you at the surface is the bacteria, but actually the bacteria that is important in gum disease is under the gum line where we don't see it like it underneath here. So just to to summarize, periodontal disease is an inflammation uh, that it's due to the bacterial imbalance. And I will talk a little bit more about between good bacteria and bad bacteria. Um, it results in the destruction of tissue. And what is so important is that many of us have periodontal disease. But not only elderly, the periodontal disease can start in, uh, in young adults um, at uh, uh, puberty, that we call uh, aggressive periodontitis, um, and Down syndrome, which is connected to Alzheimer's disease, and Dr. Davis would be able to, to, to confirm that, uh, Down syndrome is characterized for a, a high percentage of people have aggressive periodontitis. So, we propose that all the inflammation and the bacterial disturbances that are characteristics of gum disease would potentially contribute to Alzheimer's disease pathology. One of them would be amyloid, the one that Dr. Dr. Davis talked about. So we started um, uh, uh, this um, research by looking at people with Alzheimer's disease and normal, and we looked at their signs that they were infected with periodontal bacteria, with the bad bacteria, at one point in, in life. And our results show that indeed the Alzheimer people had more antibody to bad bacteria compared to the normal. Um, one of the critiques when you deal particularly oral health and periodontal disease would be, well, Alzheimer people don't really clean, so is that normal to have plaque? Which is absolutely true. First, the, the disease is due to not only the bacteria, but how the host responds, how our body responds. And I, I deal with that all the time in clinical practice because I have to tell the patients why they have periodontal disease and other people that are exactly the same don't. Angela, if I may just interrupt, yes. just for a point of clarification. When you say plaque, you're talking about plaque around the teeth, not the plaque in the brain. No, no, no. Yes, 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 yes. The one, yes, yes, yes. Dental plaque. Two kinds. Dental plaque, yes. <laughs> yes. Sometimes I say PD and the neurologists think I'm talking about the Parkinson's disease and it's still periodontal disease. <laughs> so, what we, so what we decided is to look at people um, with, with periodontal, to measure periodontal disease and also the amyloid plaque in the brain. And this, so what we found Destruction 
of periodontal disease associated, in other words, correlated with plaques in the brain. In other words, if the destruction was more, the plaque was more, and we published this data. And I wanted to show here, um, here, on the upper picture here, first of all, let's look here. What it means is that when you have a lot of yellow and red, means that there is a lot of amyloid accumulation. Here, there is less, little or no amyloid accumulation. So this one represents a patient with periodontal disease, and the other one represents a patient without <laughs> periodontal disease, approximately the same age, the same kind of history with APOE, uh, and other risk factors, gender, for example. And what we see here is the people with periodontal disease have more amyloid accumulation than people without periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. Then we went on to look at bacteria. Is there any difference between people who have markers, biomarkers, of amyloid accumulation <coughs> or compared to those who do not. And I must admit that although my hypothesis was the one that it's very rare that you hypothesize and the results support the hypothesis. In this case, I was very pleasantly surprised that the people with biomarker of amyloid, they had increase in bad bacteria and decrease in good bacteria, which tells me maybe not only bad bacteria is important, pathogenic bacteria, but also the bacteria that is associated with health, and that's good bacteria. So um, that, that would be... Good. Well, I have a lot of questions, but let me ask you a question before, right. before we, 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 we move on to, uh, to Terry. And first of all, thank you for not showing the really disgusting periodontal disease. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some that are really I, nice. I thought that, that it's before cocktail. <laughs> you're, you're I exactly didn't right. want to discuss all um, of you. <laughs> one quick question is, are the bacteria found in, in, the, in gum disease are they getting into the brain, or it's a, it's a very different mechanism? Uh, well, we don't know. For the, okay, we don't know 100%. However, we know that some of the, we know that some periodontal bacteria get into the brain, even from, we have histories of um, brain abscesses that have bacteria. So we know that somehow they are getting there. Somehow they get through the blood-brain barrier. Somehow they are getting there. Although brain access, you can make a point that maybe the blood-brain barrier, because of the infection, was somehow destroyed. However, we find out that even in, um, in Alzheimer's disease, people that don't have brain abscesses, there are evidence that bacteria was there. P. gingivalis, which is the one that is very well known. The Treponema denticola, which is a cousin of, uh, it, it's a spirochid. Um, so those were found in, in, um, in the brains. Um, also, in animal studies, in animal studies, you can do studies in all type, and one of the models for periodontal disease you provoke a, an experimental periodontal disease in the mouse by, by the P. gingivalis, the bad bacteria, and then you look what did it cause and what did it do to the brain. So what it was found, actually one of the study got enormous pub publicity, was that there was P. gingivalis in the brains of the animals, and also there was amyloid, uh, tau, uh, neurodegeneration. So in other words, it's a possibility. Uh, I am a cautious scientist. So 
I think we're all on that. On that same thing. Yes. You sure it wasn't just because the mice weren't brushing their teeth well? <laughs> so, uh, no, no, I, I, we've got other questions to go. I'm just, um, I'm not making light here. I, this is serious. I want to ask some serious questions here. That, first, actually, that's a very good idea and would be interesting to find out if you treat the mice, what is happening. But in, in, so it wasn't such a silly idea. <laughs> uh, Terry Focas, please tell us a little bit because we keep hearing about uh, perhaps the way we need to go is some sort of early detection so that we can intervene at a point or a stage in this disease before we see a brain that is completely overrun with plaque. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in that direction. Sure. Uh, BioEye is an Israeli based company in Tel Aviv that uh, developed an app to uh, track changes in ocular biomarkers. Uh, those are basically uh, changes in pupil, um, pupillary biomarkers, things like link rate, horizontal. Terry, can we get just a little closer to the microphone? Sure. Sure. Um, ho horizontal and vertical gaze movement, uh, pupil size, pupil symmetry. We've all heard the expression that the uh, eyes are the windows to the soul. Well, there's a lot of research, obviously, that's out there that changes in these pupillary biomarkers are indicative of changes in brain function. So the basic premise behind the company was, number one, to track changes in these pupillary biomarkers over a period of time to develop a predictive test for neurodegenerative diseases. Now, 15 or 20 years ago, that probably wouldn't have been possible. Not because the research didn't exist, that research has been out there for a while, but it's actually more to do with changes in technology, and obviously today with advancements in uh, analysis of uh, film and with pervasive use of smart cameras, we can actually now have 24-7 monitoring. And this is an interesting area of uh, medicine for us as lay people, which is, you know, we're an inflection point with how medicine is being practiced, I believe, because, you know, from our generation, you know, the typical uh, protocol is you go to a doctor once a year, they take a look at you, ask you questions, and maybe adjust your medicine depending on how you're doing, how you feel. Well, now we can actually do 24-7 monitoring. And now it's giving doctors the ability to actually check in real time, dynamically, what is going on with various diagnoses or various conditions, which you can do um, through the use of smartphone cameras. So simply, BioEye developed technology where you actually will do passive monitoring. So everybody uses a smartphone, unfortunately probably too much every day, and the smartphone will have an app on it that will actually monitor your eyes when it's turned on. And it will take pictures or videos of these people like biomarkers on a daily basis. And over a period of time, it will be able to track these changes. And ultimately what we hope to accomplish is that by tracking these changes over a period of time, we will be able to predict before you see symptoms that you're going to have possibly issues with neurodegenerative decline. And that is ultimately that uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Now, the, uh, the interesting thing for, um, you know, we, I heard a little bit about the treatment and uh, you know, uh, uh, things that are being tried to address uh, Alzheimer's is um, the sister company of Bio is a company called Overwatch Digital Health, which has developed an application for the epilepsy community. Uh, our oldest son has epilepsy, has a child with epilepsy. And uh, Overwatch developed an app which works on a smartphone watch and it detects abnormal seizures for, uh, to the uh, normal movement, which are indicative of seizures, and it sends them alert to caregivers or to first responders. One of the things that has been very effective in the epilepsy community is the use of cannabidiol, or uh, the non psychoactive component of marijuana. And we're actually starting to do clinical trials next year using CBD, patients that are on CBD or scannabidiol, to see how that affects uh, their biomarkers, their ocular biomarkers, because CBD is a neuroprotectant. And again, I don't have any idea right now as far as whether you know, there's been any research with CBD in the Alzheimer's community, but it's certainly something that's very important in the epilepsy community. And our son takes CBD. Um, and he had brain surgery when he was four years old. Um, he was seizure-free for about a year, and then his seizure started up again. Uh, he's been on CBD for the last five years. That's the only drug, if you will, that he takes. He does not take any pharmaceuticals, and he's been seizure-free. So we know it works. The 
interesting thing about CBD, or I should say the, uh, the, the difficult part about CBD is that we don't know exactly why it works. We know that there's a cannabidiol system in the uh, people and that uh, there are receptors. But, you know, we've had a lot of experience with children that have di been diagnosed with the same exact uh, diagnosis of epilepsy. And for one, it'll work completely. And for another, it's just like you gave them water, it won't work. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done in this area. Unfortunately, we're starting to see more and more of it, but that is something that we're going to be tracking as well on our side is to see, you know, for children in the epilepsy community that are taking CBD, whether we're starting to see changes in these pupillary biomarkers, which maybe could be used down the road to help out with Alzheimer's research. So, Terry, I, I, I know you're going to have some questions for him. Comments, really. I mean, I think this is a, an incredibly interesting area, one that will grow. Um, there's an enormous demand in the research community to have more information about patients. You know, when we're doing a clinical trial, we, we, you know, we interview the patient, we make sure they're appropriate for the trial, we give you the dose of drug, and we send you home for three months, and then you come back and we test you, see how you're doing. Well, what if we could use a smartphone app and test you every day, you know, to get some idea of how you're doing, rather than waiting three months till you come back? We should be monitoring people every day. And there's lots of ways to do this with I mean, the eye movements are, are an attractive idea. We don't know whether these eye, bio, eye markers will work, but, but this is one idea, and I think it's a very exciting one. We are working very hard with other groups to develop apps that you have on your phone, and once a day, maybe your phone will buzz, and, you know, you press these four buttons. You know, see if you can remember how, answer these three questions. I'm not quite sure how it will work, but our desire is to monitor people much better than we're doing it now. And I think this is you know, really a way of the future. That, and the government has recognized this too, that they're putting a huge amount of money into better monitoring of patients. I think it will help a lot. And even more interesting in some ways because the, the, uh, a smartphone app would require you to actually engage and do something. Wearables yeah. are even, would <laughs> even require you, oh, depending on, on how much they can make and they can follow you. But for example, in epilepsy, um, they, can, they can tell you a lot without having to even actually uh, inter interact with your. Uh, with the phone, and we keep hearing this. What's what's very interesting here now is, and I and I see and hear this now, not just in, in, in Alzheimer's, but in a number of other diseases. How um, a dentist looking into someone's mouth, and, and an uh, optometrist uh, or ophthalmologist looking into someone's eyes, may actually be able to, uh, if not completely diagnose, but actually have a very good idea of a number of diseases, not just not just Alzheimer's here, by looking at what's going on in their mouth and what's going on in their eyes. But Terry, so one of the questions though, when it comes to these kinds of um, uh, technologies, obviously the cost has gone down, so the enabling technology uh, may be that we just sort of have to figure it out, is, and I'm not sure how we go about this without taking many, many years is, how predictive is it if I see some changes now in a 40-year-old, even before they have uh, MCI, mild cognitive impairment, or let's say they have mild cognitive impairment, we've seen a few things that people have tried to figure out, is this really with, with brain scans and, and spinal taps and so forth, is it really predictive of who's going to progress to Alzheimer's? Do we have any real data that we can hang our hat on at this point? We've, we've done two clinical trials. Uh, the last one started in 2017 at Shiba University in Tel Aviv. That's an ongoing trial. Um, we're starting to get data back now after two years, uh, which is helpful. 
So the short answer uh, is we don't know how far in advance we can predict it, but uh, the, uh, the intent is actually to get, uh, obviously, at least you know, several years of data in hand before we can uh, kind of put more of a, uh, a number around as far as how far in advance we can predict this. But you know, even, even from a perspective of, if it's even just a few months, uh, it is still helpful, as Dr. Davis pointed out. I mean, early detection is paramount to treatment and changing lifestyle habits, whether it's changing exercise habits or the diet. Uh, there's also societal uh, issues as far as you know, medical powers of attorney or uh, taking away the keys you know, from grandma, you know, things like that, which are you know tragic, but you know they, they have to be done. Right. And that is you know, that is helpful even if it is just a few months. And Peter, let's make sure that everyone really gets. Uh, gets it when we're talking about the value of early detection here right. and, and intervention. We don't have really anything that, that is a, a meaningful intervention or a, a demonstrated, a demonstrated, demonstrably effective inter intervention at this point. Well, why is that? Why is that so important for clinical trials and for taking the keys away from grandma? I, I think there's two issues. I mean, one, one is the Early in the disease, you know, when, when you talk about somebody like me, who's very forgetful, you know, I, it, it's not easy to separate somebody like me who's functional but very forgetful from somebody who's very forgetful and early in the course of Alzheimer's disease. And you really want to know for a number of reasons. One is to simply plan the next few years ahead, right? My, my staff are, are okay. They don't think I'm going to go demented in the next couple of years. So they think their jobs are secure. Um, you want but, a second opinion, by the way? But, <laughs> <laughs> I probably need one. But the, you can see that some simple, very practical purposes, it would really help to know who's going to become Alzheimer's and who's going to stay a forgetful old man. You know, that's, that's a critical question. Half the people who come to our center for evaluation say, look, I've got, I'm getting very forgetful. I don't remember people's names the way I used to. I don't, you know, I, I forget where I was going. I walk into a room and forget where, and they're scared. You know, they're really scared. Most of the time, we can tell them, look, you're doing all right. You're, you're okay, you're not worse than me. You're doing all right. Um, but that's enormously important to be able to do. I mean, that's what we're there for. But the second issue, I think, is somewhat dependent on having a successful treatment and the kind of treatments that I want that will slow or stop the disease. I don't want to slow or stop the disease for a patient who's already in the nursing home. That's almost cruel, isn't it, to prolong the agony. I want to stop the disease when the patient is you know, I'm forgetful, I really don't remember, you know, that's okay, we can live with that, I can live with that. Um, that's a critical distinction to be able to make. Um, so all the help we can get is, is important. In that. So those, and I just wanted to sure. follow up on, on one point that Dr. Davis raised is that, you know, there is that um, objectivity issue. Uh, with pupillary biomarkers. You know, one of the things that we're working on yeah. with uh, BioEye is uh, actually two other apps, one related to sideline concussion detection. So you have a lot of uh, uh, players that come off the field may have a potential concussive brain injury. Um, the protocol right now is actually very uh, rudimentary. They ask questions, they shine a light in their yeah. uh, eyes, and, yeah. and somebody makes a subjective determination based on how they're answering whether there's been a concussive brain injury or not. And we know that concussions are something that have significant effects on people that are biomarkers. So now we're going to take that subjectivity out, and in point of fact, we're going to take it away from the athletes. A lot of them are reticent to come off the playing field, uh, and they don't want to, so they go back in. And there's a very shocking statistic 
that I read recently that 40 percent of all athletes uh, have uh, are actually uh, put back onto the playing field with a concussion because they've either talked their way back into the field or the person making the test or uh, undertaking the test was not uh, was not sufficiently aware of what was going on. Um, so again, we want to take that subjectivity out of it. Uh, the other app that we're working on is actually a police app, which uh, drugs, illegal narcotics, have a significant effect on people are biomarkers. And we're field testing an app right now with the Dallas Police Department that they can pull over drivers and actually put the app up to their eyes and detect whether there's a presence of illegal narcotics based on certain uh, tests that they're doing. Uh, I've also told the kids that if they'll ever get high, I'll, I'll know. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But the, the, the point I'm trying to make with, with all this is that uh, you know, one of the issues I know you've dealt with, and I had to deal with it because both of my parents had uh, Parkinson's disease and they uh, started developing some uh, dementia as a result of that, is this, um, you know, whether they really are impaired or not. And what we're going to try to do is, with these is kind of take away that, or at least have another argument to make to say, look, it's not just me, it's uh, there's actually you know, objective evidence now that we have of impairment, and therefore you do have to change your lifestyle a little bit. A reminder, by the way, to go ahead and write your questions down. We'll be picking them up in, in, in just a minute, but uh, just to, uh, not to put too fine a uh, point on it, Peter, the idea here um, with this early detection, I guess the analogy is you want to be able to intervene when you can do something about it, as opposed to someone who's had, for example, you're going to uh, someone who's had a half dozen heart attacks and is in heart failure, giving them Lipitor at that point is really trying to lock the barn door after the horse is out. What you want to do is get to them before they've had all those heart attacks. That's right. I mean, we, I take Lipitor now. You know, I haven't had a heart attack. It's got my cholesterol down to 160. You know, I'm, I'm, that's a protective. Right? That's not a treatment for heart disease because I don't have heart disease. I have, but I am taking a drug to protect my heart. As Dr. Gomez says, if, if the heart attack has happened three or four times, it isn't Lipitor I want. It's a smack around the head to change my lifestyle. Yeah. So, <laughs> it, 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 it's important to get into patients as early as you can. You know, as early as we can diagnose this, even though we don't have treatments right now, we will have. A second thing I think, you know, and I think it's wrong to ever have a conversation like this and, and without saying we can do something to lower our own risk. You know, we can do something to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And that's, you know, we all know it, you know, don't smoke, don't drink alcohol excessively, get, eat a sensible diet, get exercise, and be sociable. Don't sit alone watching TV. Right. You know, the worst thing you can do, that those five things that I mentioned, no smoking, no excessive drinking, exercise, diet, and social sociability will significantly reduce your risk of getting Alzheimer's. Dance, yes. Love the dance. Yep, there you Perfect go. thing there to you do. Go. Yeah. So, Angela, let's talk a little bit about uh, periodontal disease with this, because this is really, uh, I think, really interesting, and, and there are a couple of questions to have. We've heard a lot about the link between periodontal disease and uh, people who have, for example, an artificial heart valve, you've got to be very careful, or uh, artificial joints, they have a knee or, or a hip replacement, you've got to be very careful that, uh, because that bacteria can break loose and colonize and, and do some bad things. But we also hear that kind of the root of so many diseases here, uh, including heart disease and, and perhaps Alzheimer's, is inflammation. And you mentioned inflammation here with periodontal disease. Is that the common link between periodontal disease and, and, and Alzheimer's, not so much that the bugs are getting there necessarily, but that they're increasing some sort of inflammation? Well, I think that both of them mm -hmm. are, uh, are at play. Inflammation, 
by itself because um, if the severe periodontal disease, actually studies found uh, that the C-reactive protein, which is an, uh, a marker of inflammation in the body, gets to a level that it's intermediate risk for uh, cardiovascular disease. So it's a lot of inflammation in the body. But as I talked before, this pathogenic bacteria, the bacteria can actually get into the brain and cause direct pathology mm. there. So I would think uh, both of them, uh, about what you mentioned about um, the prim um, administering antibiotics uh, before dental treatment with the thought that during dental treatment or uh, even examination and the deep cleaning and extractions and other dental treatment, bacteria goes into the bloodstream. And it's true. But if you are healthy and your body is healthy, in about half an hour everything is fine. The problem is, what if you are not healthy? What if you have other heat? In other words, some inflammation in the body that would um, make the brain the blood barrier permeable. That would be one of the way that periodontal bad periodontal bacteria can potentially get to the brain. So I was asked in such a meeting. So what should I do? Should I take antibiotics every time I? get a, a, a cleaning or an examination? And my answer is no. Although I know people who are avo advocates for uh, antibiotics um, uh, for that. Because any time, first of all, we don't have enough evidence. So more research has to be done. That's one. Second, you always have to put in balance what do you gain and what do you lose? Medications are uh, are advantages and uh, the risk and, and, and the risks. Yes. Uh, so to give a patient every time they have a clinic, except for those conditions that you mentioned, yeah. when the risk um, it's a risk for uh, endocarditis, but except for those conditions, no, just to. Uh, to take care of bacteremia that is in um, in the blood following treatments, no, I would not do it. I have one more follow-up on that, but Carol, should we go ahead and, and start collecting uh, our our questions here so that uh, Jeff can go through them and make sure that we can all read them? Uh, so I joked earlier a little bit about getting the mice to brush their teeth better. Um, is something like that, if you have somebody with some early uh, periodontal disease, is it a good, well, it's probably a good idea for them just in, in terms of hanging on to their teeth, right? But is that kind of an intervention? Do we know whether that might have any impact and, and any effect on, on Alzheimer's disease? Um, from some of my preliminary data that I did with um, my, uh, my collaborator, what I found is that people who have frequent clinics, they have lower amyloid than the one with periodontal disease that have clinics once in a while. Um, so, so from there, it's a possibility. In other words, it's a valid hypothesis, but it has never been tested. So we need to do real studies, randomized controlled trials, and to see if periodontal treatment is a valid. Regarding periodontitis and periodontal treatment, I also want to mention it's a chronic disease. So if someone thinks that I go once to the dentist and then my life is going to become beautiful, think again. It's a chronic disease. has to be treated long, long term in order to see uh, to see differences. So even if you look for biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, 
like amyloid in the brain or in the CSF, and you have a, if you want to implement a clinical trial, still has to have some duration and intensive periodontal treatment. So that clinical trial is going to be long and expensive. <laughs> yeah. We can say that, but maybe it's worthwhile. Yeah. Absolutely. So Terry, tell me a little bit about what are you actually looking, I'm curious as to what you're looking at and measuring when you say we're looking in, at, at the eyes. What is it that, that you're looking for, whether it's in Alzheimer's, drug use, or, or concussion for that matter? Basically just changes in how the uh, pupils are reacting to various stimuli. So, um, and then there's static and the dynamic sides of it. So for example, if uh, pupil size is changing over a period of time, uh, that's one indicator. Uh, blink rate, uh, gaze movement, horizontal, vertical gaze movement. There's something called pupillary light reflex, which is where how fast your eye contracts and dilates uh, in relation to changes in light. So for example, with the uh, drug detection app, uh, it actually flashes a light to the eye because that contraction rate and then the dilation rate is directly impacted by uh, narcotics. So we're actually checking those to see if there's changes over a period of time, which are indicative, again, of uh, brain, ch uh, brain changes. So you mentioned smartphones and, and, and iPhones or something like that to, to hold it up. Um, I presume then what would happen is that would be sort of the data gathering gizmo, which would then be analyzed up in the cloud somewhere offline, off, off not, not by the cloud itself. That's correct, yeah. The, the data is actually, the video is, uh, it analyzes 32 frames per second, which is pretty standard right now mm -hmm. for uh, smart, most smartphone cameras. Uh, it uh, uploads into the cloud where the uh, analysis is done in an algorithm, and then the data could actually be sent back down to the individual, or it could be sent to the, uh, to the doctor. And what uh, Dr. Davies actually said earlier about the monitoring of the, the real-time monitoring, that's very, very important because with the epilepsy app, we actually have a doctor's portal. So doctors who are actually changing uh, drug protocols can actually go online and see right away what effects those changes in the uh, protocols are having as opposed to three months down the road when you go back, you know, getting a kind of a, a general how did it go, oh, I had a little bit of a change or I didn't, they actually will be able to see passively um, exactly what's going on. So there's that, that kind of a double use. One is that early detection or diagnostic, mm -hmm. but also then to be able to follow effectiveness of any treatment that, that you've instituted. Because if you're, as you said, if you're waiting three months, six months, or a year down the road, you know, it's a long time to wait. If you can actually get some sort of indication and monitoring mm -hmm. while the patient is, is actually under treatment, that's a big plus uh, for, for a variety of reasons. What do we got? Oh, you're smart. You're smirking. That's that's <laughs> that's, 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 that's <laughs> um, You know, this is a qu question Peter, that we get fairly frequently. Actually, we get it probably uh, at every one of our scientific meetings. What's the relationship between amyloid, tau, and AD and Alzheimer's disease? Okay. So, Alzheimer's disease was discovered because. It produces some very characteristic abnormalities in the brain. And, and there are two major abnormalities. One's called the plaque, the other's called the tangle. And for many years, we were just looking at plaques and tangles and wondering where they came from, what are they made of. Plaques are outside the brain cells and tangles are inside. There we go. He, he, he's one. He knows his stuff. That's exactly right. Plaques are outside brain cells. Tangles are inside. Plaques are made of this protein called amyloid or beta amyloid. Tangles are made of a protein called tau. So there were two camps in this field for many, many years. The amyloid camp and the tau camp. So, who, whose side are you on? It was like a religious war. Um, and, you know, the amyloid people have been winning the war in the sense that there have been probably 50 clinical trials directed towards 
stopping amyloid, the plaques, and I, as far as I know, only one phase three trial aimed at tangles so far. Um, so the field is very much out of balance. It's swinging dramatically towards the tangle side. We are testing now, um, I, I can think right off the top of my head, of five anti-tangle therapies that are now in the clinic um, in most of them in phase two clinical trials. They haven't gone to the big phase three yet, but that's likely over the next uh, six to nine months that these tangle therapies will move up. Now, there's a third camp which has been neglected for a long time that says, well, there's an a another abnormality that leads to plaques and tangles, and maybe that will be bacterial, or in some people's mind, a virus. You know, there's that whole idea was neglected for 50 years. And now there's a, actually a prize of a million dollars for somebody who proves that Alzheimer's disease is caused by a germ whether it's a bacteria or a virus. There's a million dollar prize for somebody who proves that. And there's significant money going into that research. And there should be. You know, I, I mean, you can say if you're an amyloid person, oh, it doesn't matter. You can say if you're a cow person, oh, it doesn't matter. Why don't we try everything? Why don't we try everything? So in other words, amyloid and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, tangles may not be the actual cause, You're look, we're seeing them after the damage has been done. But they may be the scars produced by the disease. You know? So we don't know yet what the driver of the disease is. So we've got a number of actual peri periodontal uh, questions over here. A lot of people with bad teeth out here. Um, <laughs> bad gums. Um, Oh, here we go. Is tooth whitening safe? Does that make any, does that make any difference in, and change uh, the biology uh, of the mouth? And, and kind of related to that, by the way, we keep hearing, uh, how many of you have heard of microbiome? What the micro, turns out we've got not just a microbiome in our guts, but we've got microbiome on our skin. It's all different, <coughs> different populations here. And uh, we, we can easily say that we've got a microbiome we in our mouth as well. We right? have about uh, 700 uh, different types of bacteria in the mouth yeah. Um, yeah. and each one of us would have about 200 under the gum lines so they could be a variation of them yeah. uh, but yeah. are some of these okay. different and in terms of whitening uh, I am a periodontist I don't do whitening but it can cause um, sensitivity. Um, I would say what advice I give to my daughter. Is that really necessary? <laughs> if I am a pretty girl, why do you need it? <laughs> um, you, we, we talked tangles, we talked plaques, talk germs. Uh, what we haven't talked is genetics. Right. Um, and so there's all, obviously there is in some cases a genetic component. And we've heard of this ApoE gene. And some people are being tested and they find out they have it and they're at higher risk and so on. What about that? There are, there are a very small number of people in this in the world where Alzheimer's disease is truly inherited, where if you get the gene, you get the disease. We know of about a thousand families worldwide where this is the case. That's it. For the vast majority, this is not a clearly inherited disease. It's just not. It's very common. So we can have 
a mother and a daughter in the office at the same time, both with Alzheimer's disease. It's a common disease. Doesn't mean it's genetic. Now, there's an APOE is one class of risk factor gene, and there are now at the last count was 60 different genetic abnormalities that can increase your risk of getting the disease. And it's very important to understand what that means. It means your risk will go up. It doesn't mean you'll get the disease. So or every disease known to man, your risk of getting that is a product of three things. Your genetics, right, your background, um, your diet and lifestyle, and life events like infection or um, accident or trauma. Genetics is one part of your risk, but it's not the major part in Alzheimer's disease. But unless you're a member of one of these extraordinary families, and let me give you a, an idea of those families. We've studied them for years. The disease begins between 38 and 42, and the patient is dead around the age of 50. And this has gone on for seven generations before they knew it was Alzheimer's disease. So these are extraordinary families, and the vast majority of people with Alzheimer's disease don't belong to those families. So, if you do belong to one of those families or suspect you belong, then you need to join a special study for genetic Alzheimer's disease. But for the vast majority, 99.8% of patients, you have a risk based on your genetics, your lifestyle I talked about. You know, get yourself a healthy lifestyle, reduce your risk. Um, and stay away from concussions and don't get hit on the head multiple times. <laughs> I'll try to remember that. Um, there's a couple of those questions that I, that I want to get back to, but first, Terry, you know, one of the things that everybody uh, always asks, and, and, and I expect that, that Jed will have uh, something like this, is when are we going to have this? When are we going to have this? You mentioned that some of this is in uh, some of these technologies are in some early phase clinical trial. Israel, you said, and, and some offshore. Where where are we in those clinical trials? And, and assuming obviously positive results, when can we expect some to actually see something that we can do? <laughs> I won't tell the FDA. Yeah. <laughs> My crystal ball isn't uh, isn't working that well, but uh, we're, we're going to actually open up clinical trials in the United States. Mm. We want to get uh, additional uh, numbers in there. We've had this preliminary discussion with Johns Hopkins to that end. Uh, I would say that, again, this is just an estimate, uh, probably the next uh, 18 months is when we're going to, to try to get something out. Mm. How's the, the clinical trials in, in Israel? Those are these are for, for the same technology. That's correct. Same technology. It's uh, it's been going on since 2017. Shiva University in Tango. And this is for Alzheimer's, concussion, it drug is, use. It is for neurodegenerative, so Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's. Parkinson's. Uh, interesting. All right. Um, the other thing that we haven't talked about, and and this may be there might be I suspect some overlap here between. Uh, gum disease and, and some of the risk factors that, that Peter was mentioning, uh, something that uh, this individual is very interested in is environmental factors um, because it seems that the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is going up. Um, and I think we're missing the fact that it's because we're getting older and that's the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, correct? Um, as it is for cancer. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the, it, it, the number of Alzheimer's cases is climbing and quite dramatically, um, but because we're living longer. You know, at, the, at the beginning, at 1900, life expectancy was about 42. 
We didn't really have an Alzheimer's disease problem when life expectancy is 42. In 1985, everyone said there's no Alzheimer's disease in China. 1985. NIH went to look in China. 1985. Is there really no Alzheimer's? Life expectancy was 62. There were very little Alzheimer's below age of 62. Now in China and across the world, people are living longer and we get more and more Alzheimer's. Don't think, I mean, I don't believe there's an environmental risk factor simply because everywhere we look, the instance of Alzheimer's is about the same. So, Japan, China, Norway, Chile, Mexico, you know, where, where people live long enough, there's Alzheimer's disease. So I don't think you can look at diet, you know, something magic, yogurt, I was hearing about today, um, you know, something magical there. It's a disease that we get as we get older, and it doesn't really care who you are, you know, where you live. Um, and Angela, someone asked, I mean, they were asking about gluten sensitivity increasing, inflammation, sugar in the diet, uh, other environmental factors, chemicals, herbicides, and so forth. We don't have any evidence of that impact? Regarding the, the sugar in the diet, that's a risk for uh, cavities. Um, is that possible that uh, ca uh, bacteria that associate with cavity could have an influence? It is possible, but I don't know uh, about any, st any study on that. But I would like to mention about um, on periodontal disease, uh, the study that received a lot of uh, attention um, about two or three months ago, where they administer a uh, uh, gingipine inhibitor. Gingipine is a virulence factor of P. gingivalis, which is the bad, one of the bad bacteria in um, responsible that contribute to periodontal disease. And what they found is that this uh, inhibition of the virulence factor caused the decrease in neurodegeneration in, uh, in the brains of the mice and also reduced the infection. And actually, there is a clinical trial going on using the gingipine inhibitor uh, for this. Um, I have one uh, comment about that. What they did, uh, what they, the purpose is to attack one bacteria. And it's not wrong because if you attack a virulence in one bacteria, you might change the community of the bacteria. The bacteria are there like uh, we are all, all of us here, communicate with each other and they feed on each other. So it's not a bad idea. However, uh, my uh, my concern is that this is and the, it's not really a concern if it's working. It's still a drug, so I think um, there are other ways to treat periodontal disease and to get to balance that unbal uh, uh, of unbalanced bacteria besides the drug. So I am more of a conservative. <coughs> Is there, but is there such a thing as a probiotic for bacteria in the mouth? It, it, uh, yes, there are some studies and the, the inflammation was better. Um, there is nothing like in the gut uh, for Alzheimer's disease. There is nothing yet established. But it's an interesting uh, uh, subject that I have, to, uh, we have to tackle. Uh, can study that. Um, you know what I what I like to do. And forgive me, we're we're running we're running a little bit out of time. But what I like to do when when I do these these sorts of things is to ask each of our panelists 
for their take home pearl of wisdom. Something that if there's one thing you want our, our audience here to, to remember uh, about the topic, uh, what might that be? And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, Terry, you're going to have to start here, Terry, because you're on the far end over there, so uh, give it a shot. What, 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 what's important about what we've been talking about tonight? The, the fact that we don't have a cure, um, that we don't really know how to tackle this. Obviously, we're going through, down a lot of different paths. The same is true of Parkinson's, the same is true of epilepsy. The take home is that keep an open mind, look at other neurological conditions, see what's going on out there, read about other things, because they're, these are all intertwined at some level. And so something that might be working in another uh, area could have a pretty significant effect you know, in the Alzheimer's community as well. So you know, this is, you know, this is a, a, a journey that we're all taking together, whether it's epilepsy or Parkinson's or dementia or Alzheimer's. So my takeaway, from, you know, like you all to keep in mind is think about, you know, and read and be informed about not just what's happening in the epilepsy community, but in other neurological diseases and what they're doing to address issues in those areas, which could again have a positive effect on the Alzheimer's community. Break out of your silos. Yeah, which is what we're talking about here with, with periodontal disease, obviously. Angela, what's your take-home message? There is quite substantial evidence that periodontal disease associated with Alzheimer's disease, even that increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, however, we need to understand the precise mechanism and we need to do clinical trials and yes, they are expensive, but I think that the return could be fantastic if it turns out that bacteria and inflammation that it's associated with, with periodontal disease have a role. Peter? <laughs> oh, come on, um, I have had time to think about it. <laughs> my, you know, my message is always optimistic because uh, I've been around this field a long time, and it, over the last few years, I've really seen progress, which is um, enormously important. But, but I'll tell you one thing I've also seen is that it, it's so important to be engaged. Um, and I don't care how you're engaged. Dance, get involved with caring kind, get involved with something, you know. Um, because it's clear that an active, energetic lifestyle, as best as you can do it, is helpful in reducing the burden of Alzheimer's. I mean, organizations like this are great. There's social engagement, there's intellectual engagement, and there's practical help for patients. So, you know, being involved with something like this is an enormous asset. We're getting there in research. You'll get reliable information from this organization. <laughs> you won't have to, you know, read the Times and wonder, is this another piece of BS? <laughs> so I almost said it. Um, another piece of BS. Listen to these people. Go on their website. Look at what they're doing. Good, good, good. Thank you. So my little I, I've got little bits of, of take-home uh, wisdom here uh, to extract a little bit from, from what Terry said is the early detection will uh, hopefully uh, make a difference and to overlap a little bit with what uh, Peter and Angela said. The one, take part in clinical trials. That's the only way we're going to move the field forward and really know uh, what's going on. And Peter mentioned uh, several things that are that are risk factors, and I would have added uh, one or two others, but and and now we know at least one other, which is periodontal health. Um, and I always tell people, if it's good for your heart, it's good for your brain. So whatever you're doing, whether it's lowering your cholesterol, exercising, anything that you do for your heart, it's good for your heart. 
it's good for your brain. And now I can also say, if it's good for your mouth, it's good for your brain. <laughs> I'm serious. If it's good for your mouth, it's good for your brain. So take care of your heart, exercise, and brush often and make sure that you get those cleanings and that you don't have periodontal disease, right? Good for your heart and good for your mouth. Uh, and let me turn it over now for our final thoughts to our fearless leader, Jeff Levine. Thank you, Max. I'm gonna up this mic. Oh, thank you, Max, again, for a wonderful job uh, moderating the panel. And thank you to the panelists for interesting, innovative, new thinking about Alzheimer's disease and, and uh, hopefully finding a way of detecting uh, early uh, before people are, are clinically um, affected by the disease, before they're really forgetful, and before they lose function. That's really, the, I think, one of the real take-home messages here. And let me reiterate the um, uh, request to participate in research trials, because one of the reasons why many research trials don't do as well is because they really have trouble finding people to participate. And we have on our website a really easy way to locate. You don't have to go to clinicaltrials.gov and look at 2,000 uh, trials. You can simply go to our website, look at Alzheimer's and dementia, and then you'll see a resource center, resources there. Just click on clinical trials and research. A little blue box will pop up that will match you in about 60 seconds. Might take a little bit longer. Uh, you answer some questions and you'll find the clinical trials that are in your area that are recruiting for subjects. So, you know, take a look at our website and search for clinical trials there. Let me also say, and I think, Peter, you mentioned the uh, antiviral trials. Yeah. It's actually the very first antiviral trial is starting at Columbia uh, University. And so, um, actually, in our next newsletter, which will be coming out uh, in, a, in a week or so, uh, there's an advertisement for that. But that trial, I believe, is on our website. Um, it's, uh, so it's the first ever antiviral Alzheimer's trial. Really kind of interesting new breakthrough uh, in trying to find another way of uh, uh, looking at a uh, pathway for, for Alzheimer's disease. So um, it's really important, um, I think, that we have people participate in those trials. Um, so I, I want to thank our panelists for your work, for your commitment to the cause, to your belief that we will get there, and I do believe that we will get there one way or the other. And as I say every year, you know, uh, on behalf of myself, on behalf of our children, on behalf of all of our affected relatives, if you could just hurry it up a little bit, that would be good. Uh, we've been waiting a long time. Um, I want to thank you for, for coming and uh, encourage you to take a look at our Caring Kind table, learn more about our resources and services, all of which are provided free to families and caregivers. And they are, we're able to provide those free programs and services because of the generosity of the community. The Alzheimer's community depends upon Caring Kind and we depend upon all of you to keep us uh, uh, afloat. So all of our generous donors and sponsors, and I encourage you to, you're able to make a donation today at the donation table, and so I would welcome that and thank you for your uh, support. And um, so, yes? I have one question. All these tests and research, do they uh, specify to people that have visual blindness? You know, we'll, we'll talk about that um, maybe afterwards. So there is a, um, there'll be an opportunity to kind of meet with and speak with the panelists afterwards. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I want to thank the panelists again and Max for a wonderful job. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.